murder was established, it was still the bigger threat was alcohol. Mm. And then we had you know, cigarette, bangi, you know, and the drugs, what you know as drugs, were not as much. Now we're seeing the trend is growing on the use of synthetic drugs. So what are these synthetic drugs? What are synthetic drugs? Uh, thank you, Latif. Uh, I just want to lay, to allay some um, thought that uh, synthetic drugs are new. Mm. Uh, and let me start with this uh, old adage that says, uh, necessity is a mother in, of invention. Uh, the use, production, use and distribution of synthetic drugs dates back as far back as uh, the end of the, war, the First World War, the Great War, which became the First World War. Uh, after the First World War, very many war veterans came back with a lot of injuries. And uh, one of the medications that was used to, to suppress this pain was morphine. So in the 1920s, we had a lot of uh, what we call the morphine derivatives. Mm -hmm which was also synthetic. Mm. As you know very well, morphine is a narcotic analgesic, which is used to cure, to suppress very severe pain. So within that period, there was an abuse of uh, morphine and it morphed into very many forms. Mm. Yes. Uh, it was also very amorphous. You could find <laughs> it in different uh, forms and flavors mm. in the 1920s. And uh, a lot of work was done to, to, to deal with that phenomenon. Then um, in the 80s, we got the fentanyl. Yes, mm. and it was commonly known as the fentanyl, fentanyl analogs mm. because uh, within that uh, uh, fentanyl consumption, you could find it in very many forms. Uh, 10 years later, in 1990, we went into the space of amphetamines. You heard about the crystal meths. Mm. Then uh, 30 years later, in um, 2010, 2020, mm. we have the new psychoactive, psychoactive substances, mm. call them the NPSs. Mm. Now, synthetic drugs are made from precursors and these precursors are normally illicit drugs somebody creates a cocktail of uh, codeine something else just to mirror the effect of uh, uh, drugs like uh, cannabis mm. yes and uh, broadly if you look at this um, look if you look at this uh, synthetic drugs broadly because of how they impact the brain receptors. I can broadly put them into categories of uh, cathinoids and uh, cathinoids, yes, on how they impact uh, the brain. But uh, generally, if I put them within the mainstream of uh, the different type of drugs, I can uh, call them uh, amphetamines, where an example is methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. We have the opioids, where uh, uh, fentanyl falls and uh, natural opioids are like uh, heroin and, uh, and cocaine. Mm. Now, why the proliferation of uh, synthetic drugs? Uh, number one, detection. It is very hard to detect synthetic drugs. If you look at, uh, you've gone through these airports before, a sniffer dog will come and uh, sniff out uh, uh, other drugs. Mm -hmm. Synthetic drugs, the way it is made, it is very hard to detect it. In fact, we need to retrain our dogs on how de to detect uh, synthetic drugs. Mm -hmm. Not forgetting that maybe when they're transiting through the airports, it is illicit substances, which is later mixed in a lab mm -hmm. to create mm -hmm. the synthetic uh, yeah. makeup. Yes. Oh, uh, okay, sorry, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, another thing that makes this thing very elusive is uh, because it's not plant-based. You cannot do supply suppression at source. Mm. Today you can go to to Afghanistan and uh, scotch at the, the uh, poppy fields. Poppy, poppy, poppy fields. Mm. For the synthetic, there's no geographical location where you can uh, 
associate mm. with the source of uh, the synthetic drugs, like you do with cannabis. Today, if you ask somebody where where cannabis is grown, they can roughly give you the geographical location. Mm. Yes. Thirdly, and most importantly, it's uh, the risk factor that comes with uh, synthetic drugs. And the risk factor is uh, twofold. Number one, the calibration. Because of the mix of so many uh, synthetic components, there's no control on the effect they will have on the receptors mm. and uh, the aftermath of that effect. Secondly, uh, the dangers of other elements that are introduced to the synthetic uh, drugs to make it not only potent and also marketable. Mm. Uh, earlier in the year, you saw us uh, fighting uh, against uh, Shisha. And I don't want to go into details on that because there's a court matter on it. But it was not the Shisha we were fighting. Mm. It's the stuff that introduced in those Shisha, most of which was synthetic. Uh -huh. That uh, portends a risk. And that is why before we get to that space, we need to have standards for such products as Shisha. Mm. And that's a journey we need to walk as a country. Indeed. Yes. So when you talk about standardization, it's a painstaking process, isn't it? Because here you're looking at the, the known substances, the things ones you already know, the methamphetamines and the fent fentanyl that we talk about and all of these things, finding their way into the country. <clears throat> if the ones that are here already and that would be under some kind of legal umbrella even for those the standardization of those has not been done to the point whereby it would be okay and when we talk about illicit alcohol for example and that's just under the guise of what is already allowed in the country what would that process look like to then be able to say look class it um and now let that have a, a standard under which it can or cannot operate will it be declared illegal completely should it be declared illegal completely? And if you were to go into that process, how then do you ensure that it's actually off the streets? Because black markets thrive in the, in the illegality of something. How then would that happen? Thank you very much. Uh, that is why I'm here. This is part of advocacy. And uh, the fight against illicit alcohol and drugs must be fought mm -hmm. by everyone in the country because this affects every fabric of society. If you look around, at least there's a family that has, has been affected by this uh, alcohol and drug uh, issue. Now, as a country, we are very clear on what alcohol is licit and what is illicit. Kenya Bureau of Standards has standards for all alcohol that is allowable to be consumed in the country. Uh, and scrupulous uh, business people have opted to bring on board illicit alcohol. Mm -hmm. Latif, you'll be very surprised that um, Kenya Bureau of Standards has standards on even some of these traditional uh, brews. Mm. It's only that people have not achieved that standard to be able to produce it commercially. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are so many risks, risks that come out of producing this illicit alcohol out of the standard. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. And uh, one of the issues where we have standards is to control. And one vital thing is uh, alcohol content. Yes. Mm. It must be calibrated. It must be measured. You must know yes. the volume of alcohol in this, what yes. you're taking. And it must be produced in a certified, healthy environment. What I wonder, sorry, sorry no. No, what I wonder, Daktari, is like you've explained to us. So what, when you're talking about the synthetic drugs, it is drugs that are being manufactured somewhere in a lab, bring some, you know, legal drugs, come create this concoction and create a new substance that is now uh, becomes uh, uh, the, 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 the drug, the, the synthetic drug. Is this being done in Kenya or are they coming as already manufactured synthetic drugs? Is, so, there, is there production of synthetic drugs in the country? Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Let me go by data that we have. In 2023, at the airport, we confiscated uh, nearly three kilograms of uh, methamphetamine. Last year? Last year, mm. yes. And uh, we are still in the discovery space of these synthetic drugs. Mm. Like I said, it doesn't have a face. And uh, our detection process has even been impeded by what I call poly users. Your average uh, partying individual in Kenya might start with uh, codeine, uh, take some mirror, mm -hmm. go into alcohol, and finish with cannabis. It complicates the detection process such that... Uh, this this in, is in one sitting? In one sitting. I call them poly users. You know, okay. people start with cannabis, they finish with alcohol. Mm. And uh, in instances of overdose, it is very hard to detect what the cause of that was. And that is why we are doing a lot of advocacy to our citizens and our young people that uh, the drug space, number one, has been proliferated by unscrupulous business people. So be sure of what you're taking. Okay. Even if it comes to alcohol. So are they being manufactured here or are they being brought into the country? Most of the, most, most of the synthetic drugs are made from uh, derivative, I mean, um, precursors, mm -hmm. which are available locally, you see. Um, and people, people use different precursors to come up with these synthetic drugs that uh, are being used. Now, to give you an example, in Kenya, we've only detected two types of uh, synthetic drugs which is methamphetamine and ecstasy. Yes. Mm. Uh, it doesn't mean that it is not prevalent because of the challenges I'm telling you about detection. Yes. So how does the CADA do? When you say that, you know, there's a, an emerging threat yes. of these synthetic drugs, yes. but you have challenges of detection, you have challenges of even knowing um, what kind of uh, precursors have been used and so on and so forth. How does the CADA know that there's an emerging threat? You see, uh, the government has, ad has adapt adopted a three-prong strategy, mm -hmm. which is it has adopted from best practice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I'm doing here is uh, what I call prevention. That is the fact that I'm having this conversation with you, telling you that uh, there's uh, people use alcohol through enema, there exists uh, synthetic uh, drugs, is the beginning of the preventive conversation. The second part of it is the treatment part. And that is uh, a space where we do a lot of discovery and data collection. Uh, we'll only know the after effect. If you do it very discreetly, we'll only know the after effect or whether you're using these drugs through the medical treatment uh, uh, space. So do that, you have that capacity as NACADA to liaise with health centers, health facilities and doctors to know that there's an increasing number of people who are coming uh, to facilities exhibiting these symptoms and the likelihood is use of synthetic drugs. Yes. I mean, are you, I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is, are you basing this on any empirical data that you have as NACADA that shows there's actually a threat here of people, more and more people using synthetic drugs? Yes. We have that capacity and we do it. One of our strong points and one of our mandates is to do research. Uh, we have a rehabilitation center in uh, Mombasa called Miritini. And in Miritini, one of the key things we do is we dispense methadone. And methadone is, uh, is also a synthetic drug, but a good synthetic drug that is administered to people who've been using hard drugs over a long period of time. One of the key uh, key uses of methadone is to reduce the withdrawal syndrome and uh, rehabilitate the system out of hard drugs. Now, we collect, I told you about poly users, and that is one of the follies of uh, this research process. Anecdotal evidence shows us that people say they've used this drug at, on one time or another. For example, the statistics that we had in 2003 two, shows that 0.3% uh, of respondents said that they used opioids. Yes. Mm. Where this uh, fentanyl 
uh, falls in. Mm. Uh, so we have that capacity, and that is one of the things that we do. And because we've detected the presence of uh, methamphetamine and ecstasy, we've started sensitizing people. It's only through this sensitization that people will come out and say, indeed, we are using this drug. And I can give you an example um, of one of the respondents whom we talked to. They say they were using something and it had been concocted by this individual who sells it. Mm. We cannot be able to tell whether it's fentanyl. We cannot tell whether it's tromadol. But from the effects of the drugs that they exhibited, we see it's an opioid. Mm -hmm. And it's not a natural opioid. Mm. Yes, like heroin. Mm. So it's that those are one of the indicators saying that uh, there's synthetic uh, drugs that are being used. Yes. Okay. Mm. From a law enforcement angle, what's being done? Because there can be the raising of the awareness, the health matters, whereby and you shouldn't be chugging anything from that direction. You shouldn't be. And then uh, because you have to now deal with things like addiction and such. But then about the flows of these drugs into society, into communities, from a law enforcement point of view, what is being done to curtail the flow? Yes. Um, as NACADA, we coordinate a multi-agency uh, team. And one of the fifth key things that uh, is unique to synthetic drugs is that there's no plantation. Mm. So what's the next visible thing? It's a lab. We are conducting surveillance to ensure that uh, there are no labs proliferating around. Secondly, as a form of ne network disruption, we try from a very ethical perspective to conduct a lot of uh, surveillance mm. and intelligence collection to try and uh, work backwards when we apprehend some of this uh, would you apprehend some of these uh, people who are selling these uh, illicit drugs to try and uh, make sure that we we disrupt that network mm -hmm. and uh, identify where they're getting this uh, these uh, drugs from. We've been had. We've had a lot of a lot of success uh, in uh, the space of uh, uh, cannabis. A lot of success in the other hard drugs like cocaine and heroin, including illicit alcohol. Do you work with other law enforcement agencies? Um, if we're talking about, you know, the police, for example, because yes. we know for a fact, I mean, they can trace a guy in less than three hours yes. who was, you know, living on top of a tree in the middle of wherever. Is it? They can find the people who do this, so do you do work with them? Yes, they can find and they do find. Mm -hmm. Just the other day we apprehended uh, Mama Ongara, one of our efforts within the space. As NACADA, we have the demand reduction side, which looks at uh, programs, mm -hmm. education, advocacy, like I'm attempting to do today. We also have a component of uh, research where we try to understand the trends within the market. Thirdly, we also have a, a very strong uh, team, compliance team that does uh, demand uh, a supply reduction. Mm -hmm. And in that team, it is comprised of officers from NACADA, a very elite team from uh, anti-narcotics unit with all the capabilities of, uh, uh, just to use your expression, getting that someone on the tree. Mm. Uh, and we're making a lot of headways in, uh, in uh, supply suppression. And that is why uh, you see there's a reduction in the traditional uh, drugs. And uh, I started by talking about this adage that says, necessity is the mother of invention. You know, every time we, we find uh, a way of suppressing supply, on the natural uh, opioids, these people go back and uh, become very innovative on the space of uh, synthetic drugs. There's, what you say makes sense, and the efforts which are being made by law enforcement, the need to suppress it, they are laudable. But there's a problem here. And I don't think the supply causes it. The demand, what makes the demand possible? Is it that we have very many people now and we are better informed now and we know of 
the multiplicity of what is available. But then why do we need to tickle our brains? Because drugs do just that. They go to the part of your brain that makes you happy. And when you get addicted to that happiness, what we call a high, then these are problems come in. Why do people suddenly, why is there this great need to be high? You said you have a research component. Yes. Because if people don't need to get high, then we don't have a drug problem. We just have people using drugs every once in a while, but we have a problem. Why do people need to get high? What are we running away from? I'll, I'll answer that in, uh, in, two, in two parts. And let me focus for now the youth. First of all, the sensationalization of uh, drugs is something that has happened since for the past one century. Yes. It is cool to do drugs. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, 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 the starting point is a fast experience. Some people take drugs for the first time out of peer pressure, out of experimenting, and they don't like it. So they don't continue using it. But there are those who get this experience that they'll always yearn to get. And that is what causes addiction. Now, uh, one of the approaches we're using for demand reduction is through advocacy and education to implore upon people to go for rehabilitation. Secondly, psychosocial support. Thirdly, we educate you on the adverse effects of using these drugs. That is the only way we can uh, reduce the demand. Hmm. Yes. Can I push a little bit more on that question that CT asked? Because it seems as though there's something that's going to make folks go towards these drugs and to continue in the practice of imbibing. Why? Is, if, if the research goes to say people are drinking a little bit more because they don't have an adequate source of employment, for example, people are drinking a little bit more because there's a mental um, health challenge here or there, and it goes across board, young people, older people, there must be a trigger somewhere that leads to this and then also leads to um, this coping. Because most times, People will use drugs as a coping mechanism. There is an underlying issue that perhaps if that was dealt with, it would make the work on this side easier. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, social spaces have contributed to this. Mm -hmm. uh, push and pulls from celebrities have contributed to this. Let me give you a perfect example of... Uh, one of the surveillance outcomes that, uh, that uh, took place a month ago. There are these generational activities that are, that are taking place a month ago. Mm, generational activities. Yes. <laughs> As, and, uh, and, uh, wow. Uh, well, nice one. Uh, and uh, and uh, one of those activities culminated into a concert. Yes. At the heart of uh, the city of Nairobi. Mm. Uh, my team was conducting surveillance from a supply and supply suppression and research perspective. And in the process, we were able to interact with some of these young people. But if, let me tell you, uh, out of the 21 young people who were casually uh, talked to, 16 smoked bang for the first time during these activities. Yeah. Yes, and half of them said they did it because they were told it will it will diminish the effect of tear gas. Now, if the feeling they got was that feeling that uh, tickles uh, the dopamine and the receptors in the brain, mm. they'll keep on going back for that experience. So the induction into drugs is a key point that normally determines whether you get addicted or you get out of it. Now, there are other sociocultural social issues surrounding why people get into drugs. I'll take, for example, alcohol. In some parts of uh, the country, you find people getting inducted into alcohol at as young an age as eight years old. Mm -hmm. And they get inducted into alcohol not as an end, but as a means to something else. For example, this rite of passage that uh, 
normally happens in a certain part of the country. During the process, the young people are inducted into alcohol. Some perpetuate that uh, behavior from there going forward. Others are traumatized by the experience and they don't uh, proceed. And evidence has shown when you ask somebody, why don't you take alcohol? They said, my experience when I was 12 years old and I was going through this, it reminds me of that period, mm. a painful past, you see? So there are those social cultural things that uh, push this youth towards that end, including the issue of unemployment. Are we saying that the background, the eco systems where young people are nurtured in mm. doesn't contribute significantly to this trigger that we are speaking of? Because <clears throat> if in a home setting, parents are undergoing stress due to the vagaries of the life we live, say in this country, Will that not have a very, very direct impact on the children? Actually, it has a direct impact on the children, the environment, not only the environment, but also genetic dis predisposition. Mm. There's a genetic component into, into alcohol and drug addiction. Yes. Yes. And that is why one of the key preventive uh, measures is that psychosocial support. Mm. And I talked about the youth because I purposely left out the parents. They need to lead by example. What the youth see parents doing, they do. Thank you. Well, Dr. Mariko, thank you very much for joining us today. I think, yes. like you said, yes. there is need to have these constant conversations, exploring the various ways in which we need to deal with this issue because it is an issue in the country. Yes. Dr. Anthony Mariko is the CEO of NACADA. We've been talking about the emerging threats of synthetic drug use in the country. 8 a.m.